Welcome to this edition of EU TV. Um, we will be talking about the field of male lower urinary tract symptoms today at this uh, 2022 um, EU meeting. And uh, I would like to welcome our guests today. So first of all, uh, Dr. Kari Tikkinen, who is a professor of urology, University of Helsinki, uh, did a fellowship of clinical epidemiology uh, in Canada. Kari, welcome. Thank you very much, pleasure. Dr. Dean Altman, a uh, special guest, a urological surgeon uh, with the University of Toronto, specializing in functional urology, particularly BPH and neuromodulation. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming. Great. So Kari, may I start with you? Um, we have had a discussion this morning in the plenary talking primarily about the novel techniques that we have to offer for our patients to treat male LUTs. Mm -hmm. There was no talk about medical treatment. Can you enlighten us? Has that changed much? Is there no interest anymore in drugs? Are the novel treatments the new drugs? Um, short answer is they are a little bit uh, in terms of like what we are talking, they are a little bit like that. One way I may say a little bit unfortunately, I, I would love to see new drugs. Uh, I would love to see new drugs for PPH and LUTs and uh, all sorts of uh, problems. And, but yeah, if you look back, since the uh, launch of Mirabecron, I would say there hasn't been any new drugs coming to the market. Of course, there are some drugs in pipelines, but not so much focus, unfortunately. Hopefully, the researchers and companies are going to invest more in future also on drugs. But the good thing about it is, uh, the, good, the good news is that we are really getting more new devices since five to ten years. And now they're slowly or fast. They are, Something in between, maturation is going on, we're getting more data. So in that sense, yes, uh, devices are a little bit replacing the drugs in terms of new discoveries. All right. So we'll come to the devices in a minute. Uh, but Dean, you gave a very nice presentation on the diagnostic work about those patients. Um, do you want to give our audience a short message, um, just some you know, points that you would like to raise that are really important in that patient core? Well, I think that the EAU guidelines recently updated set a great example of what we should be doing for the workup. It's evidence-based, it's clear, it is pragmatic, uh, and so all of the members, I think, should really look to that as a guidance. But remember, guidelines are really there to keep you in the right lane. They're not the, the holy Bible, and you're allowed to have your own clinical impression, your expertise, and you also have to think about the individual patient. And so a little bit about what we talked about this morning was, yes, following the guidelines and seeing what is a strong recommendation versus maybe a weak recommendation. But one of the points that we really tried to emphasize all of us in the discussion is talking to the patients to assess what is their personal preference, mm -hmm. their values, their expectations, so that you can actually tailor the treatment. Because we have so many treatments now, and each one may not fit for every man. May I have a follow-up question for that? Um, I think you made a critical point. The patient is really in the center of everything. Um, so we can tailor the diagnostics and the treatment according to the patient's profile. Do you want to give us another statement about uh, urodynamics and uh, when you would recommend urodynamics in the diagnostic workup of those patients before surgery maybe? Yeah. So the guidelines are actually quite clear that urodynamics are not indicated for all men presenting with LUTs. And there's a number of recommendations as to when you could use your dynamics, but they all come with a weak recommendation. Right. And so I think this is one of the areas where the expertise in functional urology comes in. If someone has had previous surgical treatment and they didn't respond, if someone has mixed LUTs, a lot of storage and voiding, uh, then you might want to understand what's going on. Right. So a lot of patients actually don't mind. We heard today in the discussion about having your dynamics. I think it was you, mm -hmm. Kari, because they feel they're getting extra investigations and the cl clinical picture is much more clear. I understand. Well, Kari, um, we have been seeing also working in the guideline group for the last 10 years together, um, so many new techniques uh, that are evolving and we still consider them to be investigational techniques. Some of them are actually on the market for quite some time. They have maybe a five-year follow-up. There are RCTs. Um, 
And there was a lot of talk about not comparing apples and pears. Um, can you give the audience an idea of why those techniques may not be comparable? Uh, what aspects they actually cover and maybe they're different to various patients' expectations? Uh, critical, important question. Uh, first of all, I mean, some of the techniques are more like, like TURP as the gold standard. You actually remove prostate tissue. And, and some of the new techniques uh, 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 that happens, uh, in some not. Another issue is that some of the techniques are much more invasive than the, some of the techniques. And so, for instance, uh, the, uh, where you actually, the prostate size substantially decreases, of course, the, uh, the enucleation, of course, is the, when you reduce the most, and then there's the biggest efficacy, probably. Right. But often, the the more efficacy, there's often also risks of harms and also a nucleus and there's a learning curve. Then, then, then uh, aquablation, uh, we need more data, but, uh, but the, we are getting more data and, and, and aquablation uh, uh, is one of those um, where you actually remove tissue in the end. And then, then but now there's increasingly this, this relatively non-invasive uh, such as um, Duralift and Resume and ITIND and new, new coming uh, similar kinds of, and, and, and it's, it's really like we, they probably, we will see, this is uncertain. We have two, we need more studies, we need more data, but they're probably having a, I, I believe, they're less efficacious, probably when it comes to symptoms, but they have probably less harms when it comes to ejaculation problems, etc. So you really, uh, we really need to know what that patient wants and expects. And then based on that, you can go to different modalities. So it's, it's fair to stratify maybe into ablative versus non-ablative techniques uh, as a very general uh, assumption. Mm -hmm. Dean, um, there is a um, you know, has been for a long time now, the statement, enucleation is the new normal. Uh, it was striking me that there are differences with regard to North America and Europe, maybe in the, um, well, assumption that enucleation might be the new normal. Um, would it be the new normal in some patients who would like to only come once to the urologist and have it done for the next 15 years, in contrast to somebody who wants a very non-invasive technique and doesn't mind coming back in two years, would that be an assumption you could make? You know, I think that each of these techniques have their role. They all have their benefits when it comes to outcomes, durability versus the trade-offs. The nucleation for sure has been demonstrated to have the greatest durability, you could argue. However, it's actually done by a relatively small number of urologists practicing. In the United States, it probably accounts for about 6 to 8% right. of all resective technologies in Europe. Probably a little bit more, but probably in the teens, I would imagine. And so, you know, for something to be adopted as a gold standard, it doesn't have to be just the best. It has to be widely used as something which is a comparator. So, you know, this idea of outcomes and metrics, I think, is very important. As Kari was saying, you know, maybe all of these new products don't need to be comparable to enucleation right. or TERP. You know, maybe the proper comparison is to medical therapy. And so that is why we get to the heart of the question, which is what is important to the man. If they say that durability is the number one thing, absolutely. Offer them prostatectomy, enucleation, uh, it's open, simple, endoscopic, it doesn't matter, they'll do great. But that's not going to be the primary goal for everyone. You know, when we have these cases, we present the data. Yeah. Maximum flow rate, IPSS. We don't include in the case scenario what is important to the man necessarily because we don't know. Easter. So the biggest takeaway from this morning is many options, including enucleation, including mists, but you have to ask the patient what is important to them. That's a great statement. So um, many techniques and maybe one of my uh, learnings was that the level of evidence now that we have for those techniques is becoming better and better. Mm. Like 10, 15 years ago, um, the evidence level in BPH may LUTs field wasn't very high, and now it's becoming much better. Um, and to follow up on that, Kari, um, to define success and failure probably depends on the patient's expectations, right? So we can't have a, general, a generalization of 
a success because it might mean something else to every patient. Would that be right? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, uh, it, it exactly like, like you said. We, we, we have to practice shared decision making. I think that's the good medicine. So, and part of the shared decision making is that you actually know what the patient expects, what's important for him in this case, and and what what other values and preferences, what he is expecting. I think always when you do BPO surgery, you need to tell a little bit about the prognosis for the patient, whether he is going to be able to pee, what symptoms are more likely to uh, uh, be treated, what may not be that well treated, such as maybe nocturia uh, by by BPO surgery, and then also a little bit about complications. Uh, uh, the risks of surgery, but also the long term, such as ejaculation, erectile uh, incontinence, these issues, and 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 then it's uh, then the failure or success is whether you can do those, uh, improve those issues which matter to the patient and avoid those harms. But so so uh, yes, in the in the end of the day, this is this this should be personalized. And and yes, we we were talking about the the big picture that typically patients. What, the, what are the typical average values and preferences? We we'll also talk about that, but, but for when you have the o patient in the office, uh, you really need to assess that particle individual's uh, expectations. So in that respect, Dean, um, there was a very conceptual talk by Malte Rieken about mm. um, sequential treatment, something we do in prostate cancer, we've been doing in other oncological entities, but maybe we should start doing that in BPAH too. Depending on the expectations of a patient, telling him, look, um, that one procedure may not last forever. So look, you have several options. You want the one-stop shop or you want, you know, can you comment on that? You know, I actually think we're already doing sequential treatment a lot. There's a lot of watchful waiting. Yeah. And we have medical therapy, we have monotherapy, then dual medical therapy, and then getting on to surgery. So all we're really doing now is introduce maybe this middle category of mists, minimally invasive therapies, and the notion of the sequential treatment hasn't changed that much. It's just an added number of sequences. Right. And we know that some men will respond very well to medical therapy, maybe alpha blocker, and for the rest of their lives, they'll be happy. For some men, they'll fail medical therapy, and of course, they'll have to go on to something else. So adding a mist will probably be sufficient for many men, and they won't have to go on to the next sequence, the right. more invasive surgery. So I don't think it's wrong to think of it as sequential because Many men will be very happy as they move through the sequences. And perhaps the more uh, invasive surgeries should really be reserved, potentially, for those who are failing and who need something more uh, definitive, maybe like in oncology. That brings me to my last question, uh, maybe to both of you. Um, the um, colleagues attending this meeting are coming from various countries in the world, and they have a very different background with regard to healthcare systems. And that also alludes to the amount of money they have access to in their system. And of course, these new techniques are quite expensive at times. Um, would the financial issue be a paramount issue, maybe um, avoiding that some patients would have access to it? Um, so we're talking about money that you could spend or could not spend. Uh, so do we have enough studies they're actually analyzing the outcome in relation to the costs. We, we didn't talk that much about that today. I, I, I think we are, we are not yet there. Uh, and I think it's also very difficult because the costs for certain modalities are actually quite different between yeah. the countries. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering a question, but, uh, but, uh, but I, what I, I think what we should do uh, is that uh, I think uh, people should learn more enucleation techniques. I think that's because as you told that only small minority that doing it and it probably improves outcomes in, 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 in many situations. That's what I would like to see in future happening. Then regarding mist, I mean, all these minimally invasive techniques, um, they all, I think, still need more study. So what I would really recommend that when people take these new techniques, they maybe choose one, uh, and and if at, at, at the time, but then also they would do some research on it, like at least prospectively follow their own patients because we are, the data is not yet mature and, and we, we need more data. All right. Do you just last statement on that 
You know, I think every place in the world is going to have their own economic medical uh, variables. You know, yeah. We've done some cost effectiveness analyses, cost utility, where you can actually model things based upon what is in the published literature. And then you can apply it to some parts of Europe, some parts of North America. Of course, there's uh, in the UK NICE. So people are looking to do the cost effectiveness analysis, uh, but it's not going to be every technology in every country. That's just not going to be possible. Right. Thank you very much to both of you. It was a pleasure doing this uh, interview with you today. Thank you very much to our viewers of EU TV. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I think um, we are very happy that the field of male LUTs, BPH, BPO, um, has come to a stage where many of our colleagues attending meetings are actually interested to listen what's new. Uh, and I think this field is evolving. We'll hear more about this, uh, more outcomes. So it's a very exciting time for everybody that works and um, does studies in the field of mail us. Thank you very much. Have a great meeting and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.